Hello folks, it's Wills here. Um, I'm going to take you through some of the mechanics that you can expect when playing The House Doesn't Always Win. When you grab a copy for yourself after we launch on Kickstarter, oh god, two days from now, Jesus Christ, on Wednesday uh, the 18th. So I'm just going to take you through uh, a couple of the basic rules to give you an idea of how this game plays. So if you followed my tweet yesterday, uh, you should be familiar with this. This is how the game is sort of set up from the start. You've got your diamonds all laid out in uh, number order. You've got your targets, your jack, queen, and king at the top of the board. For this one, we're going to be playing with the uh, the king as the target, so we've just pushed him up. But you can also just take the other two characters and take them off the table. And then finally, every other card is placed here, shuffled in the supply deck. So this contains every spade, every club, and every heart in the deck. Um, so based on where you are in your campaign, or if you're playing at one shot, this deck might be slightly altered. Uh, especially considering these cards, which we'll get into in a bit. But essentially, this is going to be the most important part of your game. This is going to play replace all of your dice rolls. It's going to replace um, your sort of health mechanics that you'd be used to in games. It's all streamlined into this single deck of cards. So, how do you do anything in this game? Well, as you might have seen in the setup, we're going to be playing as one of the face cards in the deck that's not a diamond. So, for example, I might be the King of Clubs, I might be the Queen of Hearts, I might be the Jack of Spades. Now, depending on which of those cards that you pick, you're going to have certain starting abilities, which are going to be different per class, uh, as well as a certain affinity with um, one of the suits. So, in this game, when you're ever choosing what action that you want to decide to do, Everything is going to be taken as based on which suit you're going to be playing that action in. So, for example, let's say that there is a guard at a front door, and I'm trying to convince him to let me through. So I could just, you know, go completely away from that and, uh, and try and sneak around him. So that might be a spades action. Spades are stealthy, they are agile, um, they are finesse. Uh, they use all kinds of acrobatics and quick thinking. Uh, and hidden movement to get their things done. For example, if you were playing like a rogue in Dungeons and Dragons, you'd be really good at spade actions. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everything they do is to do with stealth and finesse, um, because you can do pretty much anything in this game with any suit, it just means that you're going to approach it differently. So let's give our example that we had earlier. We're trying to convince this guard to get out of our way. Now, I could use hearts. Hearts are the sort of... Uh, persuading, uh, very clever, very uh, perhaps detective-y kind of characters. Um, they're very good at understanding things, picking things apart. But they're also good at understanding people. They're good at empathy. They're good at picking apart why somebody is being secretive about something, maybe calling them a bluff or even just convincing them of things in a more sort of, uh, let's say, personable manner. Uh, however, clubs, clubs are very athletic, they can be quite brutish, but that also means that they can be quite intimidating. So if we were going to use this uh, this opportunity to try and convince this guard to get out of our way, yeah, we could go up and try and use our silver tongue, but if we're not quite as good at heart actions, maybe we are the king of clubs, then maybe we want to use a club action to get an advantage on our draw, and that way we might be using instead some intimidation tactics, trying to scare him out of his position so he doesn't come up for a fight. Uh, so let's see how that would go. So you would have a be, be having a conversation with your GM at this point. Let's say that you're one of the players. You're playing as the King of Clubs, and you want to intimidate the guard. And the uh, the GM will say to you, okay, so this guard, he's pretty well trained. Um, and in most circumstances, this would be a Clubs 2 challenge, which means that you're going to need to try and draw two clubs from the top of the deck as you draw your cards out. But for you, because you are a club's character, your modifier is minus one for clubs, which means that you're going to draw one less club before you succeed. So in this case, you only need to draw one club, and that action is going to pay off. So you would start by drawing your first card. You take the top card of the supply deck. Oh, and look at that. You've drawn it yourself. So whenever you draw a face card in this game, uh, I genuinely didn't plan that. I've just shuffled this deck. Whenever you draw a face card in this game, it counts as a critical success, which means that you automatically succeed when it's drawn, as long as the face card that you've drawn matches the suit that you're trying to find. So in this case, we've not only drawn um, a face card of the suit that we're trying to find, but we've also drawn the card that represents our characters. But because we are playing as face cards that you can find in the deck, that means that your character is physically represented in this deck, and their sort of life can be on the line 
whenever you're trying to do something. So in this case, if we were looking for hearts, for example, this would be a really bad draw for me because I'm trying to find hearts, which means that this counts as one of the failures because it's not a hearts card. And if I were to get all the way to the end and lose my cards, which I'll get into in a minute, that means that I could lose this card from the deck and something bad will happen to my character. So carrying on, let's say that we didn't draw a, uh, a mega crit in the, <laughs> in the first draw. But in this case, just to explain how that works, if you draw your own character when you're looking for that suit, it's what I call a mega crit, but it's essentially a, a super critical success. It means that not only do you critically succeed, but you also get to affirm something about the world around you. So you, you get a chance to uh, turn the tides in your favor. So for example, you could say, okay, not only does this uh, guard you know, instantly crumble under my terrifying visage, um, but also he runs so far that uh, you know, he's never going to be a problem for us again. He's completely left the area of operation. He's so terrified that he's run back home and not informed anyone of our presence. So that would be really good for us. But let's try that again. So we're drawing cards and we're looking for one club. First one we draw is a spade. So this counts as a failed draw. Um, as a standard character, you can draw four cards which don't match the suit that you're looking for before you fail your, uh, your draw. So in this case, this is going to count to one of our four. Um, if we were playing as a jack, for example, their special ability is that they are the jack of all trades, or at least it's their starting special ability, because I've also won't be available for them. Because they're the jack of all trades, they get to fail five times instead of four, so no matter what suit they're drawing with, they get an enhanced chance of not failing whenever they do something. So they get a little bit more time before they have to bow out of the draw. So we draw our next card. And it's a club. So in this case, that would count as one of our successes. We put it at the top there. And that, because we're only looking for one, counts as a success. So in this case, we've succeeded at the action that we were trying to do completely. This means that whatever we were trying to do happens, whatever we set up before the draw happens. Um, and anything that was on the run gets discarded into our discard pile over here. So in this case, whenever we draw an ace and it gets discarded, we reshuffle the deck. So these cards eventually will come back into our uh, pile, which means that we're not missing out on these cards. So for example, now that I know that this King of Clubs is in the discard pile, I can't use it anymore. So we need to find an, an ace in this deck and make sure we succeed with it so we can get it shuffled back into our supply uh, and I can get that chance at Mega Crit again. But let's try something a little bit more difficult. Let's say we're still playing as the King of Clubs, but this time we're trying to persuade him. So clubs, they're not very good at heart actions. Uh, they're better at talking with their fists than they are with their mouth. So in this case, we're actually going to get a plus one modifier to our heart's ability. So if I wanted to draw against this guard and he has a heart's level two, then I would have to take an extra card out matching that suit to be able to succeed. So in this case, I would need three hearts to succeed. Um, now, you might be thinking, okay, well, why wouldn't I always use clubs? Well, for example, um, intimidation isn't exactly the quietest method of doing things, and your characters are, at your heart, very, very, uh, sorry, very much in a difficult position, because if they're found out, these are, you know, people who are rebelling against the current status quo. If they're found out, they could be in some real danger. So you might say, okay, look, I know I'm not very good at persuading people, but I'm going to give it a go because I'm pretty sure that if I at least uh, partially succeed, then I'm not going to, you know, turn any heads and not draw too much attention. Whereas I went over looking for a fight, things are going really bad for us. So in this case, I'm going to use hearts and just see what happens. So in this case, we start drawing again. So our first, first card is a club. So unfortunately, if, if we were intimidating, that would have been a success. But in this case, it's a fail. But we carry on going and we've got our first heart. Good start. So in this case, we're looking for three. So I'm just going to keep drawing. And... We've got ourselves a crit success. So in this case, as I said, you've drawn a face card that matches the suit that you're looking for. And in this case, that means that even though you've only drawn two so far, because you've got the face card, that count, count, yeah, sorry, counts as a critical success. Um, now, because this isn't the card that represents your character, it's only a standard crit, which means that it's an auto success, but you don't get any special uh, additions on top of that. But let's discard that again, and let's see what would happen if we got ourselves... A little bit further along with less successes. So let's pretend that that's the uh, first four cards that we just drew. We're in a really tough spot here now because this, the King of Spades, uh, although it might not represent one of our characters, it's still one of our crypts that's in the deck. And if it does represent one of our characters around the table, if this gets thrown away as part of a, uh, a failed challenge, that could potentially kill 
one of the characters around the table, or at the very least is going to permanently do some damage to their stats. Because in this case, let's say that somebody was playing as the King of Spades and they had their minus one modifier uh, with their spades and then a plus one to their um, to their clubs actions, uh, they would have to choose one of those three, or the hearts, which is a zero in the middle, they would have to choose one of those three which worsens. So they would either have to take their minus one and reduce it to a zero, they would have to take their zero and reduce it to a plus one, or their plus one and reduce it to a plus two, which means that whatever stat that is linked to is going to be very, very difficult. Because in this case, you know, we were looking for three, but in, in a case of uh, if we'd taken damage to that stat, we'd be trying to find four for a really basic action, which is really, really deadly. So here we are in a really difficult position, because whatever is on the top of this deck it's going to determine whether we fail or succeed. But we have a third option. So this game is inspired by bluffing games like poker, which means that you have the option to fold. Folding is um, an interesting mechanic because it's sort of a half gamble, um, but it also has narrative repercussions as well. So in this case, we've got three cards that we failed with, one that we've succeeded with, which means that we're pretty sure that this is going to go badly. If we draw this card and it's not a heart, that means that we failed. And in a case of a failure, all of the cards that are laid out in front of you get taken out for the from the deck for the rest of the session. They don't take this card pile, they get completely removed, which means that we'd lose a crit, we'd lose two clubs, and we'd lose a heart, which is going to worsen our odds for the rest of the session. Whilst you can get those standard cards back if you're playing a campaign uh, in your downtime, these crits never come back. So this is a really bad spot to be in, especially if this is linked to a character. If it is linked to a character, we will at least get the card back because that character will still be alive, but will permanently lessen the odds every time they make a challenge with one of the suits under their name. So what do we do? Well, we can choose to fold instead. And at this point, we're going to go from left to right and roll a d10 to determine whether or not these cards are going to stay in the game. One good thing is that a jack, queen, and a king are higher than 10, which means that it's automatically safe and we can pop that in the discard pile. The 10, obviously, we can't fail. Uh, but in the case of this 7 and 8, we'd have to roll a d10. Uh, and if we have a number that exceeds the value of the card, so in this case, if I rolled a 9 or a 10 on the 8, or an 8, 9, 10 on the 7, that card would get taken out as, as if we had just failed the challenge. But if we managed to roll the same number or lower, they'd go into the discard pile. So with these two cards, we've got pretty good odds. I'm not going to do a roll right now, but let's just pretend that we actually managed to roll a 4 and a 5, and these are all good. In this case, we've saved all of our cards, which means we've saved ourselves the odds of what would happen. But one of my favorite things about the system is because this is not a dice roll where it's just determined every time you do it, the card that you were looking for is still sat on top of that deck. So the next time you draw from that deck, you're going to know exactly whether or not you should have done that. So in this case, we start a new challenge and we draw it. Oh, thank God we didn't draw that time because another one of our crits would have been taken out and we would have lost all of them permanently. So that's a really good example of why you might fold. So what does that mean in game terms? If we're playing um, our session and I say, okay, I'm going to go up and I'm going to try and you know schmooze this guard to try and let me into wherever I'm trying to get to. What does it mean if we get halfway through that action and we fold? Well, depending on how far in you've gotten, literally how many cards you've drawn, you're going to have sort of put yourself in more and more risky positions. So if you've just drawn a couple and you've got some really bad draws and you say, do you know what, this is a little bit too rich for my blood, I'm just going to fold. Because you've only drawn a couple of cards, you might have gone up, you know, introduced yourself, said, hey, you know, um, any chance that I could get in here? And they say, yeah, sorry, this is private property. And at that point you go, okay, fine, you know, I'm just going to walk away. At that point you haven't raised too much suspicion. But if you've got a lot of cards out because you were one card away from failure or success, you're really deep in it, which means that you've actively tried to persuade this character, you just haven't gone that final step into playing all of your chips, which means that you're going to have you know, consequences to your actions. There's going to be ways in which um, the scenario has changed based on the actions that you've taken. So I think it's quite an interesting mechanic. It's, it's a way of mixing up um, you know, fail, partial success, and success into a system of... Okay, you can fail and you can succeed, but there are a lot of integers in between that that are um, 
you know completely different based on the scenario that you're doing at the moment and with this deck always changing how many cards are in there and also cards being completely removed from the rest of the game the odds can always be changed so let's take a look at how we can change those odds because as you'll notice i've got all of my diamonds laid out here how do these things work so let's say that we're doing a challenge um we draw our cards and maybe we're looking for hearts we've got two hearts and we've succeeded so that's pretty good we've got ourselves a pretty early success two hearts to draw it's not too hard of a challenge and we got there in the end but the gm revealed at the start of this uh, challenge that what you are actually targeting right now is one of the weak points in the armor of the king of diamonds let's say that um you broke into that party and you found maybe a room full of illegal activity that is so obvious and maybe if you manage to capture evidence of it you could use against them in the future uh, as part of the rest of your session maybe you could blackmail them with it maybe you could bribe them into doing something that you want so because you succeeded at this task you have the option as a group to replace one of the cards in your run regardless of whether or not it was a heart uh, a spade or a club and you get to choose to replace that card with one of the ones in the diamond run now these diamond cards count as wild cards which means that if i'm looking for hearts clubs or spades it doesn't matter if i draw a diamond it counts towards my successes so these cards are really really powerful so let's say that i say oh okay well i mean i absolutely want to get one of those cards i'm going to grab the nine because that nine is a really high number which means that we're not going to uh lose it if we fold too often which is a really good one to have on hand and now that diamond gets added to our discard pile and we get added to our deck the next time we discard an ace so this is a really really good thing to do because not only does it set you up for the rest of the the, uh, the campaign that you're doing um, that runs from from mission to mission so you'll have a little campaign tracker which you'll be writing in your notes and you'll say that the nine of diamonds has been replaced by the nine of spades when you when you clean up your uh, your cards and that means the next time you set up you're going to set your run up like this so that you know that you've got one of those wild cards in your deck now over time you got you might get multiple of these cards added to your deck let's say that you've got four of them at this point there is a question of how many of these do you put in your deck because the more of the diamonds sort of like personal information that you start mining into the more things that you start drawing out of the shadows the more that you're revealing yourself and are potentially being compromised being compromised is a really interesting mechanic because it can spell doom for your party if you're not careful so the more of these wild cards that you put in the deck the more likely you are to succeed in every challenge because you've got way more of the suit that you're looking for inherently in the fact that these ones count as every suit but let's say that we're doing a challenge and you manage to draw let's say you're looking for clubs right you draw two hearts um, and you're trying to find four clubs you draw a diamond and you're like great that's a club you draw another diamond great that's a club but then you draw a third if you ever have three diamonds in your run at the same time you become compromised for the rest of the campaign which means that these diamonds that you've been collecting up until now turn from wild cards into critical fails because every time you draw one of these diamonds from your deck you're going to have your action completely plummet from underneath you so suddenly the question becomes how many of these am i supposed to put in before we actually put ourselves in a position where we could completely fall at any moment and my cat has arrived thank you toto for turning up you want to say hello ah here he is uh so that is the house doesn't always win a, a look at some of the mechanics and how drawing in this game works um i hope that's all been a, uh, a relatively straightforward explanation there's all kinds of other things that, that are still to be talked about like how do character actions work um, what happens in between your sessions and all that jazz so if you want more information there is a link in this thread of tweets to the kickstarter campaign um, and over time we're going to be putting more and more information into those uh, in the way of blogs on the page and of course there'll be lots of information on the page itself as to how the game works and what it feels like to play and what you can do to support the project i know this is a long video so thank you very much for sticking with it thank you very much for watching uh, i've been wheels please do back the project because toto has asked you to uh, <laughs> at least get on the camera mate give me some kind of uh cats on the internet advantage um but yeah it's launching on kickstarter in two days on the 18th i think it's the 18th i will check it will say in the tweet but there we go that is uh, the house doesn't always win a risk a game of risk and revolution coming to kickstarter please help us back it 
because it's going to be one of the biggest things I've ever done in my life and I'm really excited about it. I hope this has been an interesting deep dive into how this sort of stuff works. Um, if you've got questions, feel free to put them in the tweet and I uh, will try to answer them if I can. Um, but there will be more information coming over the course of the 30 day campaign. Uh, so thank you very much for watching and hopefully I'll see you on the Kickstarter page. Goodbye. <laughs>